Plagiocephaly, also known as flat head syndrome, is the misshaping of the head due to weight-bearing forces on the soft cranium of the infant. This can be caused by pressures and circumstances in utero or can occur based on conditions that happen after the baby is born. Luckily, there are a number of ways to treat plagiocephaly and also steps parents can take to prevent it. I'm Erica Kraft Mazuda, physical therapist, and this is Parent Savers episode 67. Faster than a speeding toddler. Sit still for just a minute. Can soothe boo boos with a gentle kiss. Did you get down from there? Able to clean poopy bottoms in a single swipe. Oh, what did you eat? Turning frazzled mommies and daddies into procreators of peace and harmony. Ah, quit touching me. It's Parent Savers, empowering new parents everywhere. Welcome, everybody, to Parent Savers once again, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Parent Savers is your weekly online, on-the-go support group for parents of newborns, infants, and toddlers. I'm your host, John O'Reill. Thanks again to all of our loyal listeners who have joined the Parent Savers Club. Our members get all of our archived episodes, bonus content after each new show, plus special giveaways and discounts. Subscribe to our monthly Parent Savers newsletter for a chance to win a membership to our club each month. Another way you can stay connected to Parent Savers is by downloading our free app, which you can get for iTunes or Android devices, and you'll get our, all of our uh, podcasts downloaded automatically to your phone whenever they're ready. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and I highly suggest that you do because we engage in great conversations there, and you'll also be one of the first to know when new episodes are posted. You may hear that noise in the background, and that is one of our special guests in studio. We have parents, and we invite them to bring in their kids sometime, because we don't mind, because we're all parents, and we're all kind of used to the noise in the background. So hopefully you guys don't mind as well. Um, Let's go around, and you guys can hear who's in the room, and we can put a a name and a face to, well, not a face, we can put a name to all those sounds that you're hearing. I'm Scott Killian. I'm 36 years old. I'm a certified financial planner. I've got one boy who's three. His name's Alex. I am Dr. Erica Kraft Mazuda. I'm 34 years old, and I own Mizzouda and Associates Physical Therapy. I have one daughter who is 21 months old, and I'm about to deliver another one. <laughs> Hopefully not today, though. But congrats. When's your due date? Um, August 8th, but I'm probably going to go earlier. <laughs> there is So there is a pretty decent chance that she will be here when this episode <laughs> airs. I, we're, we're taping here um, in July, but I think this episode is going to air in August. So <laughs> congratulations. And who's that that we're hearing over there? This is Dorothy. Uh, my name's Chrissy Correo. Uh, I'm 35. I'm currently on a break from work, but I worked in education. I'm a single mother by choice um, to my daughter, Dorothy, who's 11 months old. Um, Hi, Dorothy. We're so happy you could join us. And I'm uh, I'm your host, John O'Reill. Um, I have three boys, six, four, and two. And also in studio, of course, is producer Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron, and I am the officially geriatric mamacita. And <laughs> I have one boy, and he's uh, going to be two in October. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. From time to time on the show, we like to talk about news headlines. These are, you know, funny, entertaining, or interesting stories that are in the news that would be of interest to parents of young kids. And for today's nude headline, he, news headline, excuse me, nude headline, did I say? <laughs> that, that would be a totally different feature on a totally different show. Um, we're talking about baby-sized burritos and how they've led to unusual photos. And there's uh, a restaurant. This is from um, courtesy of Yahoo News and The Lookout. Uh, America's problem with portion size has sparked a strange new photo trend, one in which parents set their newborn babies alongside massive burritos on restaurant tabletops. And I've got a picture on my phone so you guys can see it, and we'll have this picture on the site too. But according to um, the Daily Mail in the UK, a Mexican restaurant in Seattle, Washington, is saying that any diners who take photos of their babies next to one of their restaurant's big burrito grande plates get to eat for free. The child must be less than one month old, and they have to post it to the Facebook page. And so they've got a $9 burrito that they market as it's the size of a newborn. So this is one of their marketing techniques to show that they have a big burrito, um, but also, I guess, to attract new customers and parents and publicity. I would have totally done that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So would we have. (laughs) Right. I think it touches on, like, a lot of interesting things from the fact that, like, people share pictures of food and their babies, and then this is kind of combining one of them um, and portion size. But, yeah, what would you – would you do that, Scott? Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> would you dress your baby up so he would look like a different kid and you could get multiple burritos? <laughs> <laughs> I like your thinking. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so this picture, I mean, this the burrito is indeed massive. It does say that it is literally the size of a newborn because it weighs about four pounds. Um, it has tortilla meat, black beans, and rice. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so I guess everyone needs to tweet us or send us Facebook pictures of your baby, and we'll even let you go up to a couple months older than that next to the plate of food, but hopefully your babies are bigger than your plates of food that you're eating. <laughs> All right. Today's topic is plagiocephaly, also known as flathead syndrome. We're talking with Dr. Erica Kraft Mazuda, who's going to tell us about what it is, what we can do about it, and even what we can do to prevent it. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Mazuda. You're welcome. All right, let's start with the easy question. What is plagiocephaly? So basically, plagiocephaly is a misshaping of the head um, when the child is born. Their head starts to look like a parallelogram when you look at it from the top. Um, and a lot of times there's an anterior bulge of the cranium in the front. So that's basically what it looks like. And it can be due to torticollis um, or other conditions in utero. But basically, there's an asymmetrical weight bearing, meaning weight on one side of the head that causes it to be misshapen. Yeah, and doesn't have to be flat, just misshapen. Exactly, it's yeah. we it, It's really flat if it's a severe case, but you can see some cases where it's it's more... It's not completely flat. It's just kind of round, but not the, the head is not symmetrical when you look at it from the back. Now, does it have so. to be when the baby's born, though? I no. Mean, yeah, so it could, I mean, so this can happen really at any time, usually in the first. A lot of times what happens is that the, the child will actually be born with torticollis, which is another condition where the, um, the baby cannot move their head to one side. And then when they're put on their back to sleep, um, that pressure from the torticollis will actually cause the plagiocephaly. Why can't they move their head with torticollis? What is? It depends. With torticollis, there's a couple different kinds. Sometimes um, children are born where they have a, it's called a congenital shortening of the SCM, which is a muscle in the front of the neck. That can be seen because there's a mass or a bulge there where it's um, it's just shortened in utero. Okay. Um, it can also be Because they're so compacted? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It can be co- because they're compacted. It can be because there's not enough amniotic fluid. It can be because, um, you know, multiple births cause that obviously because compaction. Um, but basically, you know, that's one of the things that can cause it. But also there can be a um, another problem with the SEM where it's weak on the opposite side. And that's one that shows up more later on, which is around one to two months old, when the doctor finally notices it. And the baby has not been moving their head to the opposite side. So basically, they're going to get the, the plagiocephaly from that. Well, and that's, so. I, mean, we're, I know we're talking about torticollis right off the bat, but it's, they're pretty related. They are pretty like, related. And so it's so hard to know because right when babies are born, even a healthy baby doesn't really move their neck to one side. Correct. And because the doctor's assessment, you know, is pretty you know, usually very quick, five minutes or so, a lot of times they won't notice that. Yeah. It's the parent that notices it later on because they think, oh, my kid's head is always tilted to the right or tilted to the left, so. I don't, I'm going to jump the gu- gun mm-hmm. here, but I, um, is this now, now this happens in a, in a baby and baby's heads are soft and such. Mm-hmm. So as they grow and they grow, is this something that they grow out of or is it something that they, stays with them? It depends on the child. If it's not very severe, they can grow out of it. Um, but if it is a more severe form, they won't grow out of it, and they need treatment. So they need physical therapy, and sometimes they need a helmet. So it's like the skeletal, the structure of the skull is shaped differently? Is that? Is it's that what... it's because of undue forces on one side of the head. Oh. So you have to actually correct the problem that's causing the force on that side of the head. Oh, oh got it. Well, but then you have to correct the head. Too. Exactly. So right. you have to correct two problems. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> so it's a twofold problem. Mm-hmm. Well, so how common is plagiocephaly? Um, about 20% of kids have it. It's more common now, too, because of the back to sleep campaign that happened um, in the early 90s. Yeah. So, you know, with that, they found that putting children on their back to sleep actually prevented SIDS. And we had about a 50% decrease in SIDS. Mm-hmm. But because of that, you know, children are not, if they're not able to move their head or if they have the torticollis, then, you know, if they're laying down and sleeping 10, 12 hours a day, which or 14, which is what newborns do or more, um, it causes the plagiocephaly. I think that was kind of where it came from with my daughter. She, luck, thankfully, from the time she was two weeks old, she um, slept really long at night. She slept almost 10 hours every night. So at two weeks old, I would just, um, you know, swaddle her up and lay her down, and she would lay her head and face it to the left every night. And she slept like a log, so I wasn't going to do anything about I didn't know there was anything wrong with that. Um, and then it was around to I think two or four months four months when um I kind of started to notice it but everybody kept saying oh her face is so round and I'm like really because I feel like her head's kind of flat in the back Mm -hmm. um to me it seemed I noticed it but no one else was so it didn't really seem like it was a problem and that was when um I think in her four month checkup um at the time I was seeing two different pediatricians um which it seems kind of crazy but 
in retrospect, I'm really glad I did because I had two people's opinions. One doctor is the one that referred me because he felt it was mild to moderate and he felt that she needed a helmet. And the other one didn't even notice it and didn't think it was a problem. So I ended up kind of both pursuing it and not pursuing it because I had two very different opinions about whether or not it was a problem. That's actually pretty common when you have a, my daughter had the same thing. She slept a lot mm-hmm. and she was very big when she was born. So I knew she had torticollis, but... Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't treat it, you'll start to see, it, like, the back of her head, she had a lot of hair on that one side. There was a little bald spot. So you'll start to see that where they're putting all the weight on there. So, And then what did you do? To, to treat it? Yeah. Same thing I do with all my parents. Uh, and the thing, too, is there's a lot of other conditions that can lead to problems and can make the torticollis worse. Um, one of my problems was with her was breastfeeding. She only liked to feed on one side. And so I was holding her that way all the time. Was that because of the torticollis? No, it's because she liked that side better. It's because she's an independent. Right. Student. And that was unfortunately <laughs> the wrong side to be holding her on because it was actually making the torticollis worse. So, you know, we teach it. We do a lot of education with parents, too, on positioning when they're feeding, you know, obviously positioning in the car seat and positioning the, in the um, bed. So if you don't know those things, a lot of times you're doing things that inadvertently are making it worse. Um, so you have to correct those things. That's what we do in physical therapy is we teach them okay. all those tricks. Yeah, we'll talk about that definitely a little bit more at the break. But, I mean, so, yeah, what are some of the other things parents can look for um, to see if they think they have it? You know, basically what you're going to see, too, is a lot of times the child won't turn their head to the other side. So even if you're clapping on that side of their head, you know, if you want them to try to they turn their head to the it. left, yeah, they just won't do it. Um, but and obviously the biggest thing is to look at the shape of your child's head right? and look at, you know, what they look like in the car seat, because if they're always tilting to one side or, you know, putting the pressure on one side of their head, then that's going to cause it. After the break, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, Chrissy, what you did when you kind of followed your gut, as well as the treatment op- options that folks have with, you know, physical therapy and other devices that can help. We're talking about plagiocephaly or flathead syndrome with Dr. Erica Kraft Mizuto. So as a physical therapist, how do you help patients and parents with plagiocephaly? Let's talk about some of the specific treatment options and what you do as a physical therapist. The biggest thing is to really educate the parents because obviously the infant's not going to do exercises and a lot of times they're not going to let you just lay them down and stretch their neck. So we go through everything that the parent does, look at positioning techniques of how they're holding the baby when they're feeding how they're sleeping, how they're putting the baby on the changing table, um, what they look like when they're in a swing or a car seat or a carrier. Do you go carrier. to the house and do that? Like, do you, Or do you kind of have them show you? They they come into the clinic and they, they show us. Okay. Yeah. And so then we go through a whole treatment program that's a lot of positioning that um, educates the parents so that everything they do basically is going to promote to get rid of that plagiocephaly or if they have torticollis to also get rid of that at the same time. The other thing we do too, depending on the age of the child, um, You know, if we get one that's four or six months old, obviously there's developmental milestones that they should have met. So we do a whole developmental assessment and make sure they're meeting the milestones. If they're not, then we show the parents ways, um, exercises, you know, different activities to do with the child to meet those milestones, like rolling, sitting, you know, starting to crawl when they're older. I'm just curious, um, for torticollis, does any sort of massage work? It can, and it depends on the child because some children have tightness in a lot of tightness in the neck muscle, and it needs to be massaged. Others don't. It's more of a weakness issue, so it depends on what the actual diagnosis is with the torticollis. But yes, if it's tight, then massage will help. Yeah, I think one thing I'm learning is that plagiocephaly in itself is almost a symptom, Mm -hmm. right? It's not its own thing. Right. It's kind of like it's a symptom that's a result of... Of torticollis. Yeah. Yeah. Very few children are ever born with, with just having a plagiocephaly. Yeah, but it can happen. But again, mm-hmm. it's because something else happened to them. Correct. Yeah. Well, and so I know, Chrissy, I want to hear more about your story um, with, you know, because then there's also... Um, when you went down the path, you went with some different treatment methods. Right. I thought it was really interesting. So one um, did send me for a referral to a place here in San Diego called Cranial Tech. Um, And you go there and they'll do an assessment and they take um, all kinds of pictures of um, your child and they'll take different pictures of their head. And I mean, they can get down to like the very last, you know, nth of a degree of any sort of distortion. So almost any baby's head looks like there's something wrong with them. Right. Um, so it, it could really play upon your fears if you were really, you know, like, oh my gosh, my baby's head is totally crooked. Right. Um, I think for me, I came away from it seeing that it was in the mild to moderate category and that they they 
the therapist there did recommend stretching and she also recommended the helmet. And so I looked into having um, the helmet that they suggest put on her head. Um, it would have only been for six weeks, but it would have been 23 hours a day, um, only taking off to bath. And um, and they had told me originally that it'd be covered by my insurance and it wasn't. And they're about $2,000. Um, that was really the, a huge barrier for me um, because I just thought to myself, <laughs> This is insane. You know, I'd be paying $2,000 for something she's going to wear for six weeks. Right. Um, so what I ended up doing was looking into some alternative therapies, and I had seen that chiropractic might be an option as well as cranial sacral therapy. Um, I had been seeing a chiropractor throughout my pregnancy, so I brought her in, and um, he did a few minor adjustments. It's very simple. It's very delicate and very gentle. My daughter's very petite. Um, and I noticed that her neck was a little stiff and he had said, you know, I think this is just a packaging issue. I think you're petite. Um, she was kind of, she, I carried her very low. And so she may have just been kind of squished a little bit. And from the very first time he adjusted her that day, I put her down for a nap and I turned her head to the right side. She always favored her left mm -hmm. and she left it there. I mean, it was it was immediate that I noticed a difference. I've taken her back maybe two or three times okay. over time to um, have her adjusted again and it's gotten nothing but better and at the same time she was grow she was growing and she was starting to sit up and roll over and all those other things and perhaps unthankfully for me waking up in the night so she was no longer sleeping these huge 10-hour stretches like she used to she was all of a sudden a new person and sleeping only four hours at a go <laughs> so um, I think it was a combination of all those things that really helped to sort of even it out yeah well, I mean, it's interesting because I th I know for me personally, but I think others too, when you hear plagiocephaly, you do think that, oh, they got to wear a helmet. Right. And that's not the case. Right. It's not. And I also went and took a class um, by a physical therapist and she taught me some other um, ways of doing tummy time that didn't result in like absolute screaming um, because she didn't really love tummy time. She was not a super fan of it. And um, so when I did... Um, go to the class, I learned to just some reminders of other things I could do, you know, sitting her on my knees facing out or holding her like a, you know, like a platter um, and walking around the room. Those and wearing her, I was doing anyways, but I didn't really realize, oh, that all counts as yeah, Do you time. talk about that a lot in your classes in your therapy that tell me time we do and the, the other thing we talk about a lot too is just early intervention because it's been proven that if you get treatment before the age of three months about 70 to 75 percent of children never have to wear a helmet so it's you know you just intervene early um and then you don't they don't get a severe plagiocephaly but yes so really being looking at it early and mm -hmm. seeing that's happening. the that's the biggest thing i could tell parents is to really just watch your child's habits because like i said when you go to a doctor's checkup they don't see the kid very long you know it might be five minutes and it's not abnormal if they have their head to one side for five minutes but if you notice that hours out of the day that is abnormal yeah. so then just tell your doctor that and they can give you a referral okay but doctors are checking for that at the appointments, right? They are they're giving a cursory glance to see if the head's round. They should be. I mean, they should be looking at the head. They should also be assessing the neck just to make sure that the range of motion is good, that they can, you know, flex the head to the other side. They can rotate the head fully to both sides. So, you know, if they don't assess that, just ask them to, to check your child's, you know, if you have a concern, check your child's head and neck and they can tell you. How old does the helmet recommendation come in, though, when you need to make that decision whether or not to do it? You know, it kind of, it depends on, it depends on age, but it also depends on severity. Um, sometimes you will, and we will see a child that's three months old that has a severely flat head. I mean, if you look at it from the side, it's completely flat. Mm -hmm. They definitely would be helmeted because that can cause restriction um, in brain growth, which can lead to neurological problems and things later on. So it, it more depends on the severity of the actual plagiocephaly. One of the things I thought was really interesting, and I've since told other people, that one of the doctors told me when I went to have her um, measurements taken, that nowadays because um, children's heads are differently shaped than they used to be, high school football helmets have actually changed. The, the sizing of them has changed because children's heads, since the Back to Sleep campaign, have really, um, they're they're different. They're like really? They're a little flatter, yeah. yeah. So high school football helmets need to sort of account for that, which I thought was really interesting. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was also going to say the other reason I, I chose not to helmet her, and um, I think this is different for every parent, but 
because she's a girl, I really never felt that the shape of her head would be exposed over time. Um, I think, and I had told a, another friend of this, if, I think if maybe if I had a son, I would maybe have made a different choice mm. because his hair would be short. His head shape would be exposed. People would notice that much more. Mm. But as a girl, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling or I, I'm thinking she'll probably always have longer hair or a hairstyle that doesn't necessarily expose the shape of her head like, right. like a young boy's would. Um, and so that was another reason that I was like, you know, maybe maybe I don't really need to do this this way. I can look for an alternative. I don't know what hairstyles are going to be like in 10 or 15 <laughs> years, though, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to hate them. <laughs> so probably because of that theory, she's probably going to have some super tight, like, showing her head. That's funny. Um, my, my wife, um, she's worked with kids in foster care before, um, and I, I think I remember her saying that sometimes, like, seeing plagiocephaly would be a red flag for them somehow. But that doesn't mean that parents are doing anything wrong. I mean, it's an interesting red flag. I, I always thought that was interesting. Have you heard or have any experience Yeah, I that? mean, we always investigate that because if you get a child that has a severely flat head but that's also developmentally delayed, sometimes it's just because they're not getting the attention that they need and they've been left on their back too long. Yeah. Um, or in a car seat or a car carrier. So we always look for those things. But the majority of the time, that's not the issue. So. Yeah, and you're, it's not... It's usually not because of parent neglect that there's plagiocephaly. There's no. Other sometimes it's just the parents not knowing. And sometimes it's a cultural thing, too. Um, I've noticed, you know, different cultures that I've treated, they have different ways of raising their children. And some, some cultures will carry their baby, you know, in a carrier all the time, mm-hmm. whereas other cultures tend to leave them more in a car seat, car carrier. So yeah. sometimes it's just educating the parents on what to actually do because they don't really realize that there's an issue. Do you ever watch Breaking Bad? They're always carrying that baby around in a carrier. So I bet, they, <laughs> I bet that baby has plagiocephaly, which actually an investigation. Some of them don't. You know what happens, though, if they carry them in a carrier is that they're developmentally delayed a lot of times because they don't put them down on the floor yeah. and let them crawl around. Well, and that's the importance of tummy time, too, <laughs> right. and, you know, exploring. Would yeah. you have any other tips for tummy time? Yeah, for tummy time, I mean, I would say start right away. I mean, and the thing that a lot of people, I think, have a misconception of is they think they have to put the baby on the floor or on a bed, and then that's tummy time. It's not. There's so many different ways you can do it. I mean, when you're breastfeeding, you can always, you know, if you have your child on your chest, that's considered tummy time. If you have them in a carrier and they're not on their back, that's tummy time. Um, There's different holding techniques. So it's basically anytime they're just not on their back, I would consider that more of a tummy time. So, yeah, if your child doesn't like, you know, being directly on their stomach, you can use a ball. You can use a boppy breastfeeding pillow. I mean, you can use a lot of different things in order to, to help out. But it seems like the earlier you start that, the more the child will actually tolerate it. So don't wait too long. Yeah, one of the things they told me too is that whenever I set her down, always set her tummy first. And this was when she was really little. Now she's all over the place. But um, just set her tummy first. And if she fusses and, you know, then obviously you can put her onto her back. But it's just a good reminder for you as a parent, just tummy first. And then obviously if they fuss, you can roll them back um, onto their back. It was a good reminder. I mean, a lot of those things were just reminders of like, oh, yeah, I could be doing this. Mm -hmm. The other thing that helps, too, because babies don't like, especially if they can't move their head very well, they don't like their face to be down onto a bed or on a floor. So if you bring their arms up underneath them so that their face isn't totally down, they'll tolerate it a lot easier, Yeah, she showed me that, too, kind of keeping her hands Mm -hmm. um, in little fists tucked up under her shoulders. Um, just setting her that way. And she went, she took to that right away. Yeah. And sometimes we use a positioning wedge too, where you can put the baby on a wedge so that their head would not, if it went down, it wouldn't touch the ground. And that also is good because it promotes neck range of motion as well as strength. So if they have a torticollis because of strength and that's going to correct it. Do most patients come to you with a referral from a doctor or is it parents seeking out their own info? Both. We we get a probably, I would say, 50% from doctors and probably 50% online. Yeah. Um, if the patient wants to use their insurance, though, in the state of California, they have to get a prescription from their doctor. So okay. if they found us online and they don't have a prescription, then they still end up having to go back to the doctor to see it. Got it. Yeah. Well, I think that we did cover a lot. It finally crystallized for me that torticollis is, the plagiocephaly is a symptom and uh, not necessarily a thing in and of itself. So thanks so much, Dr. Mazuda, for joining us. Thanks also to the panelists, and thanks for listening. For more information about plagiocephaly or torticollis or more information about any of our panelists, visit the episode page on our website. We're actually going to continue the conversation uh, for members of the Parent Savers Club. After the show, we're going to talk a little bit about craniostenosis, which actually is a disease or uh, not just a symptom, but something that does happen to cause a misshapen head as well. For more information about the Parent Savers Club, please visit our website, parentsavers.com. Here's a comment from one of our listeners on our Facebook page. Jenny from Oregon asks, about a month ago, my two-month-old daughter began having nasal congestion and diarrhea. 
We were told to put nasal drops in her nose since there was no medicine for infants that young. It's been about a month and the diarrhea is gone, but the congestion is still a constant thing. She sounds clear sometimes and wheezy at other times. Any advice? Hi, Jenny. This is Dr. Tara Zanzleet. You know, she may be reacting to something in her diet. If she's breastfed, that means your diet. And if she's on formula, you could consider switching formulas. It's pretty unusual for infants to have environmental allergies uh, affecting their noses, like, you know, to pollen or trees or something. So it's often food-related. You can experiment with eliminating a certain food class, like dairy or wheat, and see if it clears up. And then you add the food back into your diet and see if the congestion comes back. Consider taking probiotics. After diarrhea, especially if she had a a little bug, they often have a different good bacteria uh, versus bad bacteria in their gut. And so either the baby could take a probiotic baby formula or you could take probiotics. Then the baby would get some in the breast milk and it helps colonize their guts. Another possibility is reflux. Even if she rarely spits up, if she had a little stomach bug causing that diarrhea, it may have caused worse reflux. The reflux can go all the way up into her nose and cause the congestion, and it can flood the lungs, causing wheezing. Medicines for reflux don't actually change this, so I wouldn't recommend them. Try having her sleep at an angle, though, her head up a little higher than her feet. So putting a few books under the legs of her cradle or under your bed, if she's in bed with you, work well. Keep her more upright than horizontal while eating. And then burp on your shoulder for about 15 minutes after a feeding. If she breastfeeds while you're both lying in bed, you'll have to sit up for some of those feeds. Luckily, reflux improves by four to five months of age. So there is hope on the horizon. And one last cause is a narrow nostril. If everything else fails and she keeps having congestion, have her see a pediatric ear, nose, throat doctor to take a look at those nostrils and make sure they're open. Well, that wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Parent Savers. Don't forget to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals, for expecting parents, and our show, The Boob Group, for moms who breastfeed their babies. This is Parent Savers, empowering new parents. This has been a new mommy media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of new mommy media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care, and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.